Bruce Lee wrote a lot about rhythm and timing in martial arts. Quite what this means or entails is something that requires a certain amount of musical training um, and knowledge to get to the bottom of. At the 2018 Martial Arts Studies Conference, we focused on the work of Bruce Lee, and we were lucky enough to have a presentation by our friend Colin P. Maguire, who is a critical um, and ethnographic musicologist, an ethnomusicologist, in fact. And he's been on the podcast before, and um, he's very, very knowledgeable on all things to do with timing, music, rhythm, kung fu, as well as uh, sideline in um, uh, Irish martial arts and Irish stick fighting. Colin is also the person who generously um, allowed me to use a sample from his own music as the kind of theme tune for this podcast. And what follows is Colin Maguire's 2018 presentation, which focuses on Bruce Lee, rhythm and timing. So, uh, with a sincere apology to Megan, I'm going to read. <laughs> The Tao of Jeet Kune Do is a posthumous book containing the essence of Bruce Lee's ever-evolving approach to martial arts as it stood at the time of his death in 1973. And just for interest's sake, can I see a show of hands? Who's read The Tao of Jeet Kune Do? Uh, nice. Uh, it was published in 1975 based on Lee's draft manuscript and notes, as well as input from his widow, guidance from his senior students, and the editing of Gil Johnson. The text outlines the philosophy, qualities, tools, and strategies of Jeet Kune Do, which was Lee's Cantonese name for his approach to fighting. The name, as you probably know, translates as Way of the Intercepting Fist, and I'll just refer to it as JKD. The aim of Lee's text is twofold. One, to argue for truth in martial arts as effectiveness and efficiency in hand combat. And two, to expound on a path of martial self-realization. The book wasn't intended as a how-to manual. Nonetheless, the text includes fine-grained discussion of the technical aspects of JKD. As an ethnomusicologist and a martial artist, I'm interested in Lee's ideas about timing, particularly the way concepts like rhythm, cadence, and tempo are used throughout the book. The Tao of JKD provides a rich foundation for thinking about being in time through hand combat, which has had a transnational impact on the physical culture of martial arts, particularly through the idea of broken rhythm. So, for example, Duke Rufus is the head coach of former UFC champion Anthony Pettis, and he has acknowledged in interviews that he's influenced by Bruce Lee. And if you watch the videos that he's got up on his YouTube channel, he talks explicitly about broken rhythm. But, don't take my word for it. I'm telling you, it is difficult to have a rehearsed routine to fit in with our own broken rhythm. See? Rehearsed routines lack the flexibility to adapt. Unfortunately, there are inconsistencies and gaps in Lee's terminology, which I will seek to rectify. My first aim in this paper is to listen musically to the core concepts of timing from JKD in order to propose a self-consistent set of terms for talking about the rhythm of combat. In so doing, I'm purposefully flipping the idea of culture as text, which we've already heard a couple people raise here today, uh, by hearing it as music, as proposed by a senior ethnomusicologist named Jeff Titan. My approach thus rests on the disciplinary conventions in ethnomusicology of studying music in and as culture and treating all humanly organized sound as music. And yes, martial arts make a sound. Given that the Tao of JKD is ostensibly about knowing oneself through martial arts, there's interpretive power in being able to think, talk, and write more clearly about how people move martially in time. I'm proposing to hear that movement first, rather than trying to read it directly. With all due respect to Bruce Lee, in the second part of the paper, I'm also going to flip his ideas about traditional martial arts training. As an ethnographer, I value the so-called classical mess that he criticized because I'm interested in the ways that martial arts structure people's being in the world, even when combat effectiveness is only one consideration among many. Drawing on long-term fieldwork at a Chinese-Canadian martial arts club, 
I apply a musical hearing of Lee's ideas about timing to a case study on kung fu performance. The ethnographic example will support my argument that choreographed forms meaningfully embody culture, and that being able to skillfully demonstrate the rhythm of combat can be as important to some people as applying it in fighting. Bruce Lee's most sustained writing on timing lies in the Tao of JKD's Qualities chapter. The book returns to these issues at several points, as when he's dealing with feints in the preparations chapter and throughout the attacking chapter. The discussion is striking-centric. He does talk about grappling in the Tao of JKD, but he doesn't talk about it with these rhythm and timing terms. Um, but a recent article by Linda Yanakis, who's a judo practitioner, uh, talked about patterns and timing in judo and shows how rhythm is applicable to grappling arts as well. While he didn't always indicate where he got his terminology from, he appears to have drawn on Western fencing, boxing, chess, uh, as well as some general music and or dance theory. It's a little bit hard to tell. Uh, most of the terms are in English, except for the name of Jeet Kune Do itself, which encapsulates the central strategy of Bruce Lee's approach to fighting. The Cantonese word, zi, uh, means to intercept, and it represents a named boxing method in the Wing Chun style of Kung Fu that was part of Lee's foundation. As the name implies, to intercept is to stop, cut off, check, immobilize, interrupt, disperse, and otherwise quell an opponent's movement, which relies on a very fine sensitivity to rhythm and timing. Timing is how one determines when to act in order to achieve an aim. And in hand combat, it's in relation to an opponent. Although interception seems to imply that the opponent acts first and that one must simply react, JKD is actually proactive. Lee emphasized controlling the timing of an opponent's movements in both attack and defense, thus allowing a JKD practitioner's interceptions to achieve maximum effect. Controlling the pace and rhythm of a fight provides intuition about what the opponent is going to do before they do it. JKD's overarching timing method is thus a version of a saying that my Wing Chun teacher taught me, which he attributed to Sun Tzu and that I can't find in the art of war. But anyway, uh, a couplet of four character idioms sums it up as act first to seize initiative, but attack according to the timing. And in Lee's own words, there is little direct attack in Jeet Kune Do. Practically all offensive action is indirect coming after a feint or taking the form of countering after an opponent's attack is foiled or spent. It requires agile maneuvering, feinting, and drawing an opponent. So that's basically how he's going to lead the rhythm of combat. Broadly speaking, a rhythm is a pattern of duration. Whether simple or complex, singular or repeated, the basic unit of duration in hand combat is what Bruce Lee called a movement time, which is the interval required to make a simple motion. For example, launching a punch, taking a step, launching a punch while taking a step, each of those would be one movement time. Lee also used the term beat when discussing broken rhythm attacks that land on what he called the half beat, but he didn't really clarify the precise relationship between beats and movement time. If I map them with music theory, a movement time forms the basic pulse of hand combat and constitutes a beat that can be subdivided in various ways or added together to form longer uh, durations. So in music, four beats is a whole note which makes kind of a nice striking combination. And in the chart I've got there, you can see the uh, North American terminology that I'm using with the British musical terminology next to it for all my British compatriots here. A single beat is a quarter note. And Lee's half beat would be an eighth note. And you can see how it all subdivides in that chart. Because a beat is perceived as occurring on the point of impact for a strike, or the moment when weight is transferred from one foot to the other in a step, there can also be a fractional beat on preparation, which would be, musically speaking, a pickup. Lee's next idea about timing was cadence. He defined it as speed regulated to coincide with the adversaries and qualified it as the specific rhythm at which a succession of movements is executed. The term cadence is unwieldy because it conflates three phenomena, rate of movement time, pattern of duration, and synchronization with the opponent. Furthermore, Lee used the word later in the text to refer to only one part or other of cadence, uh, which departs from his original definition, where they're all melded together. So if, for precision's sake, I propose that cadence be parsed into three interrelated terms that can be used independently. First is what musicians call tempo, from the Italian word for time. 
Unfortunately, Lee used the word tempo with an idiosyncratic meaning, and anyone who's familiar with Bruce Lee probably isn't surprised by his idiosyncrasies. Uh, he called tempo the beat in a cadence with the ideal timing to land an attack, particularly when a, an opponent is committed to an, a movement. And this definition seems to come from chess, where a tempo is a person's turn to make a move. Except that in chess, you can't make your move until the opponent finishes their move, so it's unlike hand <laughs> combat. An opponent loses a tempo in chess when one forces them to make a move that he or she had not planned, as when threatening with check. In hand combat, however, one can attack and steal a tempo while the opponent is still making a move, such as with Bruce Lee's favorite tactic of interception, stop hits, immobilizations, counter times, etc. The problem with Lee's tempo is that he also used it to refer to timing in a musical way. And I can't be too hard on him. He died before the book was written, so there's some inconsistencies. It wasn't finished. There's a lot of just notes that he was using. Um, so in music, the tempo is an underlying rate of musical pulse, which people embody when they tap their feet in time with a piece of music. And just as in music, tempo can and often does vary significantly. Um, during a fight, opponents speed up or slow down as they vie to control the pace of attack and defense. So notably, a movement time can be shorter or longer without changing the basic sense of beat or tempo. Tempo can even be a weapon, and uh, anyone who's watched any professional mixed martial arts would know that if someone's really well conditioned, they can impose a really fast tempo on their opponent, and it just tires them out until they can't really defend themselves properly. So tempo can be a weapon. Second part of cadence are patterns of movement, which we can simply refer to as rhythms. And while the underlying pulse of a fighter's tempo is technically a basic type of rhythm, uh, I would reserve the term for combinations of feints, steps, body movement, pauses, attacks, and or defense that adhere together to make phrases. Generally speaking, fighters execute their combative rhythms according to the tempo they're keeping. That isn't to say that the combinations have to be the same as the beat, or that there is only one rhythm for any given combination. In fact, Lee was very critical of any sorts of limits being placed on that, particularly in traditional choreographed forms. So instead, he proposed that it's more effective for combat to use movement with a variety of rhythms that allows one to remain adaptable and to avoid being predictable. The third term I'm parsing out of Bruce Lee's idea of cadence is synchronization and its obverse asynchronization. Being in time with other musicians is so basic to musicianship that there isn't really a more specific word than just sort of you know, playing music with other people. Of course you're playing in time. There are, however, several ways of talking about rhythmic relationships that are more complex than just sharing an isochronous beat, uh, which has combative implications. Lee's central concept of broken rhythm is precisely not just about attacking on the beat of the basic tempo, but rather striking in between the pulses in various ways. Successful defense requires the defender to sync his or her movements with incoming attacks. And so Lee proposed establishing a tempo for the opponent to follow through a combination of on-beat feinting, moving, and stepping, and then breaking the rhythm by going off the beat. And in the example that I have there, if we can imagine the top horizontal line of quarter notes is the attacking rhythm, and the bottom uh, line of horizontal notes is the defending rhythm. We can see that they line up vertically, so they are synchronized. In this case, the attacker is attacking and the defender is defending and they're in time together. I'll give two examples of broken rhythm strategies, although these certainly don't exhaust the topic, of course. By striking in time with the established tempo, but not right on the beat, one can use what is called syncopation, or emphasizing the offbeats. Lee talked about broken rhythm using a half beat or one and a half beat, whether with or without interjecting a pause. Doing so can catch the opponent in between movements when it's impossible to respond. So now we have the bottom line, the defender, they're locked into this tempo on this pulse. And then the top line, you can see the two blue notes, which are um, eighth notes. And the second one of those would be emphasized. That's the broken rhythm on the offbeat. So if I were to establish a, a rhythm with my jab, one, two, one, boom, boom. So it's ba, 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 accent on the offbeat. Broken rhythm can also follow the basic tempo of the pulse, but change what's called the phase of the synchronization. 
when two cyclic patterns of duration have different tempos, they come out of phase and thus become asynchronous. Lee suggested either speeding up or slowing down at the end of a compound attack so that one's power strike lands while the opponent remains momentarily locked to the old tempo. So even though the top line is using a dead basic on the beat type of rhythm, you, if you can see the line that I've drawn, the vertical line on the last beat, the attacking line on the top is ever so slightly ahead. So it's out of phase, even though the rhythm is the same. The tempo is slightly different on that last beat. The ethnographic part of this paper rests on eight years of participant observation fieldwork at the Hongluck Kung Fu Club in Toronto, Canada's Chinatown. Masters Paul Chan and Jim Chan, who you can see on the screen, uh, founded Hong Luck in 1961, and I had the privilege of learning Choi Le Fat from both of them before they passed away. Between 2008 and 2016, I was ostensibly there to study the percussion music that practitioners use to accompany martial arts demonstrations and the lion dance. A large drum is the lead instrument of the ensemble, and it's one of the last things to be learned in the curriculum. On my way to becoming a drummer, I thus spent a lot of time practicing kung fu and lion dancing. My fieldwork at Hong Luck was undergirded by 25 previous years of experience in a wide range of other martial arts, as well as my training in music, which has been very useful for thinking about the rhythm of combat. Bruce Lee disparaged traditional martial arts as a classical mess because he found them too limiting. I agree with him that the uh, organized despair of choreographed forms is not the most effective or efficient way of learning to fight. I also agree with him when he writes that, we are those kata, we are those classical blocks and thrusts, so heavily conditioned are we by them. Except that I don't necessarily see that conditioning as a bad thing. It depends on what the goals are. Not all martial arts privilege fighting efficiency the way JKD does. Forms training and performance at Hongluck was central to expressing group identity and cultural solidarity in Toronto's Chinatown. The club's head instructors taught me that actually bringing a form to life requires an acute sense of rhythm. Early on in my fieldwork, Master Paul took me aside and scolded me for not doing Kung Fu in a way that looked Chinese to him. And that's a quote, direct quote. He said, make it more Chinese. Uh, he told me I was strong but rigid, and so my solo choreographed forms apparently looked Japanese. Several years later, I finally began to develop more of the loose whipping power that Master Paul was looking for. And in watching advanced practitioners and reflecting on timing and forms, I came to see how there was meant to be a fluid breaking of rhythm at the end of combinations. The feeling, if I can describe it, uh, is like lingering mid-strike at the very last moment, gathering force together towards a final acceleration into the impact. The result can be either a micro change of tempo that shifts the phase of the final beat a little before or a little bit behind, depending on the circumstances, uh, or it can be a slightly longer hesitation onto the offbeat that creates syncopation. Within a rehearsed pattern, Breaking rhythm this way creates opportunities to adapt one striking at the last second. So it does have fighting applications. And when I figured out this time compression and expansion, fortunately, Master Paul had already passed. But I was pleased that one of his top students commented that my kung fu was finally getting a Chinese flavor because of the way I was finishing my combos. The spatio-temporal phenomena I'm describing has cultural implications that go beyond martial arts. Dance scholar Yatin Lin has observed the same subtle gathering of force toward an emphatic completion in choreography by Taiwan's Cloudgate Dance Theater, as well as in uh, Chinese calligraphy. When I studied calligraphy at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, I observed firsthand how the teacher's brushwork had the same easing, gathering, and accelerating in order to write each component of the character, often with an exaggeration of the final stroke. Lin, suggests that the quality of these gestures references an embodied cultural heritage that is apparent to sensitive audiences. When the qualities of this type of gesture are mapped onto martial arts or dance, the rhythmic features become more apparent relative to an established tempo. For Master Paul Chan and the members of the Hong Luk Kung Fu Club, performing martial arts demos with flexibly broken rhythm embodies Chineseness, contributing to the group's mandate of preserving and promoting Chinese culture and diaspora. Notably, this culturally performative being in time is available to all practitioners, even a Euro-Canadian guaylo like myself. And I'll play you a short clip. Uh, this is a Choile Fat master from uh, Sun Wui in China. I think he's in New York now. And uh, it's very short, so I'll play it a couple of times. 
and you can watch the way he breaks the rhythm, extends it out onto a syncopation on the last beat of this combination. <laughs> That was not the one I wanted to show. Sorry about that. See the big hesitation on the last strike there? One more time. Hesitation, boom. Okay. And uh, I'll conclude. Bruce Lee's Tao of Jeet Kune Do is unequivocally devoted to achieving maximum impact in hand combat, with timing as a central quality of effective and efficient martial arts. In this paper, I've parsed Lee's ideas about timing to propose a musical framework for discussing martial beats, tempo, rhythm, and synchronization. While JKD eschews the organized despair of traditional choreographed forms, I hope that I've demonstrated some of the unintended implications of Lee's critique for ethnographic research. Embodying broken rhythm in prescribed ways is not a bad thing when the conditioning it provides allows practitioners to demonstrate a culturally coherent insider's body knowledge of being in the world. There is more to be said about musical hearing of Lee's timing concepts and of the rhythm of combat in general which we'll have to wait for a longer version of this paper. Paul, you can look for it in your inbox sometime soon. Uh, it's my hope that the theories I'm developing will prove useful for future research on the intersections of fighting effectiveness, combative performance, and cultural coherence in any martial arts, not just in Kung Fu or JKD. At the risk of a finger pointing at the moon, being mistaken for all the heavenly glory, I'm drawing attention to being in time as a central organizing feature of martial arts, whether in training, in street fighting, in a ring, in a cage, on stage, or in film. Thank you.